it was necessary for us to be available for consults for primary care doctors in the United States who were seeing patients with symptoms that they didn't understand. And the scenario was, was sort of sad because doctors were calling in and saying, look, you know, I've, I've had this fellow as a patient for 10 years, and I think he's lost his mind. And after understanding the mechanistic basis for electrohypersensitivity, then the doctor is able to now understand interventions, therapeutic interventions. And because word got out that we were doing those consults, it was impossible to do them on a one-on-one -on -one basis. So we established a certification program for <coughs> primary care clinicians in the United States, and we call that the SIRSA program. Certified in Electromagnetic Radiation Safety Advisors. And we're holding that certification course now once a month for primary care practitioners and other professionals in the United States. Now, primary intervention, eliminating the exposure, used to be something that we could talk about relative to cellular phones. Because in the old days, and remember this is high technology, so the old days is 2001. In the old days, we could make a distinction between the near field plume from a cellular phone antenna, which was about six or seven inches around the center of the dipole antenna, where the highest concentration of information carrying radio waves would be, and the far field, which was the field where the intensity of the signal would dissipate What's happened now, in the past few years, is that the number of people using cellular phones in the world has risen to has risen to 2.2 billion. In communities around the world, they're going to wireless WiMAX. Yeah. <laughs> there are Wi-Fi in almost all the major airports all the major hotels. There, there are some groups who are even considering putting Wi-Fi in schools. Now, when you understand the mechanism of harm, the information carrying radio waves, wherever you have information on a radio wave, you can trigger the cell membrane response. There is no threshold. And the background level, of information carrying radio waves is now indistinguishable in most major cities from the near field plume on a cellular phone. We have a major problem. And our recommendation, and the recommendation that we are now pushing to have implemented in communities around the United States, is this it's that we have to have an alternative infrastructure to wireless. The alternative that we recommend is fiber optic. So that we want to increase fiber optic spine and decrease the amount of wireless transmission. When you have a distributed system like that, you can apply primary prevention technology to every transmission node. And you can also apply primary prevention technology to the point of use. And our feeling is that over a period of five years, if a gradual move is made for fiber optic infrastructure in place of wireless infrastructure, that the background level of information carrying radio waves can be reduced by 90%. I'll stop there and take any questions you might have. Thank you, Blake. I wonder if we can make the uh, questions Tess and Sharp, you know, and and, 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 and uh, reject the long stories of history and so on, so we can get some facts out here. Let me ask you the first question, you got. Would I be forming micronuclei in my body, do you think, you know, even though I don't live near a telephone master, use phones very avidly or whatever, despite the suffering? Yeah. 
uh, as, a, as a background. Yes, I'm, I'm worried about the you yes. see all these things are happening, but good science depends on good controls, yeah. where you've got an alternative, and you can see that uh, what happens in relation to phones or radiation is you know, happening to other people who don't use them. Okay. It's, it's, it's very clear in the research that is published in peer-reviewed journals that uh, the incidence of micronuclei following exposure to information carrying radio waves is much higher than the background incidence of micronuclei. In fact, uh, research this past year out of India shows that you can, with a mucosal scrape, pick up micronuclei in the mucus, mouth mucus, of people who use cell phones as compared to people who do not. So we're, we're very confident that micronuclei are formed with the exposure, but more importantly is that when you intervene with something like a noise field technology, where the cell membrane, the cell membrane <coughs> recognition mechanism is inhibited, you do not have the formation of micronuclei. So that sometimes the best proof that it's there is the ability that you can take it away. Okay. Yes. Say who you are, yeah, how do you are, Dr. Kellogg? BBC Medical Correspondent. Um, could you uh, tell me what did you make of James Rubin's study in the BMJ and other studies he's done where he did a double blind placebo trial of people who said they were sensitive to mobile phone signals? And he couldn't find any evidence of that. And can you point to me any uh, similarly robust trials that show the opposite? Okay, well, our our experience with our, with our registry is that, and our experience with clinicians who treat these patients, uh, I think it's a very different database uh, from the database that's in a, in a constructed trial, is that the different exposure windows impact different people in different ways. And there are different pieces of those exposure windows, different frequencies that may trigger responses in some people and not trigger responses in <coughs> other people. The other thing that we have is that the mechanism of harm that we now understand, which is disrupting intercellular communication, can lead to a whole host of different pathologies. It's a fundamental pathological um, deficit that we're inducing here. So that when I look at the studies that attempt to control the type of response that you might get from a fundamental, from a fundamental uh, pathological disruption, uh, I think that you, you would have to design a study that would be able to look at hundreds upon hundreds of alternative exposure effect responses. I don't think it's possible. And that's why we have focused our efforts on dealing with the doctors. Because what happens when a doctor is going through a differential diagnosis, he'll try something and then it won't work. And then he'll try something else. And then it might work a little better. And then he'll try something else and then it'll work. That type of information is only gathered at the clinical intervention level. And with a moving target like electrohypersensitivity, we feel that that's the only way that we're going to get information soon enough to help patients. Now keep in mind, our orientation is not research. We are trying to help patients. We are trying to provide recommendations for intervention. And in the public health paradigm, one of the basic tenets has always been that you need to be able to understand enough about a disease process to be able to prevent it. And that is the baseline that we follow. You want to come back? Do you understand how difficult it is uh, when you know, evidence-based medicine is what we are supposed to, to go on? Um, your, what you put forward today is very, very worrying. And then, as you say, there are thousands of people who report these symptoms. But without trials which can show what you're, can prove what you're showing, I mean, how, you, 
you have basically a theory. Well, no, I don't have basically a theory. We have clinical data. And let, me, let me respond. I think that you, you hit on something very important. What you need here in the UK is a postmarket surveillance system. You need a program that brings clinical data into the hands of the decision makers in an objective way. Because it is simply not viable to have researchers who are not dealing with patients who have these symptoms to try to construct reasonable hypotheses. It just doesn't work. So that what you need is perhaps Dr. Chalice and the money that he's going to be putting together here can set aside something for the clinicians. You see, this is a medical problem. It's not a physics problem. It's not a science problem. This is a medical problem because you have people who are sick. And I think that if you are going to be responsive to the needs of public health, then a post-market surveillance registry certainly should be part of what is recommended. Is that okay, Pat? Good, well, okay. Uh, hands up, please, who wants to say it? Gosh, right, man. I think you're going to say something, then, and I'll, I'll move around right here, then over this way. Okay, I'll come back in. I mean, I can't ever shut you up, so please. I'd like to ask a... Um, Stand up, please, and tell us. Say who you are. I'm a part of the Radiation Research Trust. Really thanks to Dr. Carlo and the chairman's. I'd just like to ask, with the amount of um, different frequencies that we're living with, such as tetra and wireless and all the foam masks, What's the overlapping um, of all this technology? What will to Well, <clears throat> understanding the mechanism, we know that when you have information carrying radio waves, that you are able to trigger the cell membrane response. So that if you have several sources of information carrying radio waves, you're going to trigger more cell membrane response. So it's additive. 